We are up to Mitzvah number 118, and today we're going to do 118 and 119. And again, we just started Leviticus, so there's going to be a lot of different laws related to sacrifices and all different types of sacrifices. The previous Mitzvah was about having honey or leaven in sacrifices, and our Mitzvah is related. There's no honey, there's no leaven, there's no chametz in sacrifices, but there must be salt. Mitzvah number 118 is the prohibition to withhold salt from sacrifices. And Mitzvah number 119 is the requirement, the commandment to, in fact, place salt in sacrifices. And this is something we've, we see many times in the mitzvahs. You have a commandment to do something, and then and that's the positive side. The performative side, then you have the restriction to withhold that, and that is the negative side. So it's two mitzvos for one idea. Sacrifices must have salt. Now, we've already learned that there are different types of sacrifices. There are animal sacrifices, and there are meal offerings, meal sacrifices, the mincha. Both of them must have salt, both animal sacrifices and meal offerings. Now, the Sefer Chenach, he gives us two reasons why this mitzvah exists. And as we know, the reasons, the real reason is because, well, that's what the Almighty tells us. This is a commandment in the Torah, chapter 2 of the book of Leviticus. But nevertheless, he tries to give us some sense, some rationale, some justification, some understanding that makes the mitzvah logical to us as well. And he tells us that the purpose of sacrifices in general, it's to refine us. It's to uplift us. It's to straighten our heart and soul. Our life over here is one of conflict. We have a body, and the body has an agenda of its own. And we have a soul, and the soul has its agenda. And we're kind of in between that. And we have to make choices. And we have to choose priorities. And we have to construct for ourselves, assemble for ourselves a list of values and priorities. What are we going to focus on in our limited time here? And sacrifices are there to suppress the physicality and to subjugate the physicality to our spirituality. And that's why we take the animal, almost like our animalistic self, and we say, we're going to take the animal and we're going to execute the animal, so to speak. We're going to kill the animal. We're going to sacrifice the animal. I want to take that physicality and dedicate it completely to God, completely to our spiritual agenda. And thus, the sacrifice is, of course, not there to give God food, of course. It's there for us. And it's there to awaken us and to get us live and, and to get us to live life with more mindfulness, more purpose, and more focus on what's really important. And therefore, everything that can be done to awaken our heart, to make it not just a ritual, you can have a ritual, and the ritual has no meaning, it's devoid of any real power. This should not be an empty ritual. It should be a very powerful and evocative experience for the person bringing the sacrifice. And therefore, whatever can be done to awaken the heart of the person bringing the sacrifice, that is included in the mitzvah. Says the Sefer HaChinuch, you take things that are beloved, things that are cherished, and that really gets a person's attention. Salt, says the Sefer HaChinuch, that is something that really improves everything. It improves the food, it improves the taste, it improves the smell. Salt really is the necessary ingredient for for everything. And we enjoy life when we have some salt. Of course, salt is also necessary. You don't have salt, you're not going to live very long or very well. You want to make the experience of the sacrifice with things that the person who's bringing the sacrifice enjoys and values, and therefore their experience of bringing the sacrifice will be more powerful. That's the first idea. And then he gives us another idea. Of the many functions of salt, 
is the fact that salt serves as a preservative. And we know today the science behind it and how, you know, how the salt kind of removes all those elements that cause spoilage, that cause loss and destruction. But in antiquity, you know, you would have some meat and you would leave it out and it would be inedible after a couple of days. You salt it and it could last for months. So the, one of the ways you preserve food is with salt. Sacrifices are also a preservative. It's not preserving the food, because of course, you know, you do a sacrifice. You take the animal, you're going to offer it atop the altar. So the animal is not going to last very long. But when you add salt to it, it's supposed to get your gears turning. Wait a minute, salt is a preservative. Sacrifices are also a preservative. It's there to preserve you, the person. We're here, and we could have spoilage as well. We could have destruction as well. We could lose our freshness as well. We can become tainted, tarnished, and corrupted as well. Sacrifices are there to keep us fresh, are there to preserve us, are there to help save us from destruction. You do a sin. One of the main ideas, maybe the most important idea in the Torah, is the fact that our spiritual life is as real, in fact, more real than our physical life. The problem is we don't, we don't see it. We don't notice it. We don't perceive it. Our senses are not attuned, at least the way we're currently constructed. Our senses are not attuned to notice the spiritual. We don't see the physical. The soul sees but is unseen. You do a sin, the soul's been damaged. It's been blemished. It's been hurt. You need to fix that. Because what happens when you die, the soul lives on, but the health of the soul is contingent, is dependent upon what's that state of the soul at that time. If there are sins piled up, well, the soul's been tattered, it's pockmarked with sin. What's going to be with this person for eternity? Will they endure? Will they be preserved Sacrifices are there to help preserve the person for eternity. And of course, the essence of sacrifices is repentance. There is confession, and the whole system is designed to awaken the person. Today we don't have sacrifices. We have prayer, we have repentance. But the principle that sacrifices contain, well, that exists even now. Our soul is within us, and our soul is very sensitive to the choices that we make. And the consequences and repercussions of our behavior really embed themselves in the soul. Will we endure? Will we have continuity? Will our soul be able to exist in perpetuity for eternity? Depends. Has it been salted? Has it been prepared for eternity? Have you maintained what you need to do to ensure that the soul endures? When there is a risk of spoilage, did you repent? Did you cleanse? Did you refine? Did you upgrade? Did you atone? Did you gain expiation and thus remove the blemish or not? And thus, salt really shows us, demonstrates for us what the goal of sacrifices are in general. And that's the second idea that the Sefer HaChinuch tells us why we have salt and sacrifices. Now, as he always does, he gives us some of the laws, never gives us the complete laws of a given mitzvah, because many of them you you could study a lot. The Talmud, pages of Talmud, even books of Talmud. But he gives us a little sprinkling of some of the laws. 
How do you salt the meat? You got to salt it from both sides. If you do just a little bit, well, you fulfill the mitzvah, but ideally you want to salt it well on both sides. And then he asked the question, who pays for the salt? You bring a sacrifice, you got to pay for the sacrifice. Must you pay for the salt as well? So the law is that no, you don't need to pay for the salt, nor for the logs that are burning atop the altar. And the reason is, even though you know we're going to be using salt for your sacrifice, and we're going to be consuming some of the logs atop the altar for your for your sacrifice, why shouldn't you pay for that? The answer is, explains the Sefer Chenuch, the house of God. It's a noble house. It's a house of status and prestige. In a house of wealth, there ought to be no poverty. And if you ask people to come with all the paraphernalia, bring your own wood and bring your own salt, it does seem to indicate that, well, they can't provide that. Even that, they can't provide. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look good to the temple. And if the temple says, you know what, that we will cover in-house. Now, the salting was done in different places in the temple. Different parts of the sacrifices were salted in different places. There was, in fact, in the southern part of the courtyard of the temple, there was a room called the Chamber of Salt in which parts of the animal were salted. On top of the ramp, other parts of the sacrifices were salted. All the way at the top of the altar, that was a third place where parts of the sacrifices were salted. And there are only a few things that can ever go on top of the altar without salt. And they are the libations. You don't put any salt in the wine. And the blood that you sprinkle on the altar and the aforementioned logs that are burned on the pyres atop the altar, those are the only things that ascend upon the altar without salt. Now, some more reasons that we are given by our sages to understand why we have this interesting mitzvah. The Rambam, he says that this is there to detract from the ways of the Gentiles and the idolaters. We know that we are prohibited from consuming blood. How do you remove the blood if you slaughter an animal? You have a lot of meat, but there's blood everywhere. So you have to salt the meat because the salt extracts the blood. And this is not related to our mitzvah. Our mitzvah is talking about sacrifices. This is all meat, the laws of salting. The Ramam says that we must not have any blood. We don't consume any blood. But the ways of the idolaters in the past was that they would like things bloody. And although it's not our mitzvah, the Ramban says that when you consume the blood of something, you're getting the soul of that thing. Ki hadam hu anefesh, the blood is the soul. And we don't want any animal soul within us. We'll take some animal body, but not any animal soul. And therefore, as a way to detract from the idolaters, from those who like things bloody, says the Rambam, that's why in the temple, all the meats are salted and thereby removing the blood. Now, Rashi quotes an interesting midrash, and this is yet another reason why we have salt. The verse in Leviticus says that there's a covenant of salt. There's some sort of pact, there's some sort of treaty that you have to put salt on all the sacrifices. What's this pact? What's this treaty? What's this covenant? So Rashi says, very interesting, and this seems to imply that there's some deeper messages over here. 
Since the week of Genesis, six days of creation, there was a split between the upper waters and the lower waters. Now, what that means, I don't even know. It's so mysterious. But you read in the scripture that there was a split. The upper waters went up and the lower waters went down. And the lower waters were not happy about that. They don't want to be here down down below. They want to be up on high in the firmaments. And they were mollified. They were comforted by this covenant of salt. Don't worry. You too will ascend. Why? Because you have the salt in you. We know 97, 97% of the water on earth is salt water. The salt will be taken and placed upon the sacrifices. And as a result, you too will have your elevation. And that is the way to comfort the lower waters. And thus, somehow, when we salt our sacrifices... And when you pour the water libation on the festival of Sukkot, that's a way of comforting the waters. They got the poor end of the deal, but it's okay because they too can ascend. Now, you read that Rashi, it's clear that there are deeper meanings, but this is just something else we need to know about salt. And finally, I saw yet another idea in the Das Zakain in one of the commentaries on the Torah. He says very similar to what the Sefer Chinuch says, salt is a preservative. The Sefer Chinuch says, well, sacrifices preserve the person and their soul. He takes it with a slightly different angle. Sacrifices preserve the world. Of course, God does not need our sacrifices. But we gain a tremendous benefit with sacrifices. And he says, a sacrifice that provides a clean slate. It's almost like New Year's. New Year's. You may have had a tough 2022, but now you have a a fresh canvas. The opportunities are endless. You can make something out of yourself in 2023. You could Get over maybe some of the failures of 2022 and start, start anew with a fresh start. Sacrifices are that refresh, a clean slate. If someone's dirty, they're soiled, it doesn't really bother them. They get even more dirty. But when the floors are nice and clean, and a person's nice and freshly washed, then you're more sensitive to not get dirty. You have a tablecloth nice and clean and freshly pressed. Then you're making sure it doesn't get dirty. If it's already covered in all kinds of muck and dirt and grime, well then, a little more doesn't really bother you so much. That's another benefit of sacrifices. It gives us the ability to start over. A clean slate, a fresh start, an empty canvas, an unsoiled heart, an untarnished soul. We always get a new opportunity, a fresh start, and that too is symbolized in the salt in sacrifice. Of course, this mitzvah we cannot, as of today, we cannot fulfill it But certainly some of the principles that our sages tell us about this mitzvah can be applied even today. Mitzvah number 118 and 119, the imperative to place salt in our sacrifices.